The next sort that we want to look at is the selection sort. The idea of a selection sort is that you select a particular element out of your collection and then you move it into the right place, typically with a swap operation. Uh, the simplest ways to do a selection sort would be either as a min sort or a max sort. So if we were to implement a selection sort using a min sort with these numbers, the first thing we would do is we'd run through and we'd find the minimum of those values, which of course is the one here. And we would take and swap that one with the first position. So however we decide to do it, one of them moves to the temporary the value in that location moves over and then the temporary gets stored up there. Then we repeat this. We look at everything after the one and find the minimum. That happens to be the two. So the two comes down, the seven moves over, and the two goes back up. You'll note that actually I'm willing to do this pretty much the entire sort in the video because the number of swaps that I do is quite small. So for example, we go find the next one, it's the three. So three moves down, seven moves over, three moves up. The next smallest is the four. The four moves down, the nine moves over, and the four moves up. Note that I am swapping, and this is one of the things that I really drill my students on, because if you do, instead of swapping, you could shift things. So, for example, instead of swapping the one and the four originally, so here, what I would want my students to write down, three, eight, four, five. That would be the correct configuration. Many students are tempted instead to move the one to the beginning and then just shift everything else down. It turns out that while this is a valid uh, way to manipulate things and it will wind up sorting it in the end, it's actually a much slower way of doing things and it loses out on the great advantage of the selection sort. And that advantage of the selection sort is the fact that we do very few moves. So back up here to our example, we find the five, move it down, the seven once again gets shifted over, and the five moves into place. Well now the seven is the smallest, so it moves down, the eight moves over, and the seven moves up, and now the eight is the smallest, so it moves down the nine moves over, and the eight moves up. You might recall that for the bubble sort, I was not willing to, on this array, go through and show the entire sort. And that's because the bubble sort has lots of swaps. And really it's the swaps that are, that when I'm doing things on screen are costly. To understand the, the swapping and the cost, a lot of times I will use the example of imagine that you're a valet parker and you have a crazy boss who wants all the cars in sorted order by license plate so they can be found easily. Well, moving cars around is an expensive operation. So the selection sort would actually be a great sort to use there because it turns out that the selection sort only does n minus one swaps. Okay? After it's done n minus one swaps, it's put n minus one elements in place. That means the nth one has to be in the right place as well. So it does very little work as far as swaps go. Over here, what would I want people to write down to show that they understand this? Well, we found the two, we swapped the two and the seven, and then everything else stays the same. Next line, I swapped the three and the seven. So the one and the two are already there. The three moves to there. The nine hasn't changed. Eight, four, five. Next one, we swap the four into place. So four, and it swaps with the nine. So the seven and the eight weren't touched, and the five wasn't touched either. Next one, one through four already in place, we swap the seven and the five. So the five goes there, the eight and the nine aren't touched, and the seven goes there. Those values are already in place. We find the seven is the smallest, so we swap it 
with the eight, and then whoop, no sixes, seven, eight, nine. Our last one, we just swap the eight and the nine. So this is what I would expect uh, students to trace out for a min sort. Now, of course, as I said earlier, the selection sort could be done as a max sort. Instead of finding the smallest and swapping it to the front, we could have found the largest and swapped it to the end. It's a perfectly valid way to do things. You can also do a min-max sort, where you go through a pass, you find both the minimum and the maximum, and you swap them both into place. Uh, that one's a bit more complex to write, but it works equally well. So, how do we write this in code? We have our bubble sort from previously. Let's go ahead and define, I'm going to call it min sort because that is the type of selection sort that I'm writing. Once again, I'm going to take an array of doubles and this returns unit because it is working in place. Note it's not a functional sort. Uh, we can make nice functional sorts. We will make nice functional sorts, but right now we're playing with the imperative sorts that happen in place. As before, we need to have an outer loop that is basically going through positions in the array until a dot length minus one, just like we did for the bubble sort. And what's going to happen for each one of those is we need to find the location of the minimum element. And probably the easiest way to do that is I'm going to create a var called min, and then I'm going to have another for loop. And this for loop is going to go from i plus one until the length. And inside of here we'll say if a sub j is less than a sub min. That means that I found a new element that is smaller than what I had thought was my minimum. So I set min to be j. This walks through. We do this for every element. If it's not smaller, we just skip on to the next one. If it is smaller, we remember which one it is. When I'm done, that min variable now stores the index of the smallest thing, and I want to swap it in place. So we're gonna have our same swap code here, except I'm not swapping j and j plus one, I'm swapping i and min. So we'll set temp equal to a sub i, a sub i is equal to a sub min, a sub min is equal to temp. This swap could be put inside of an if, if you want, because we don't need to do a swap if i and min are the same, so we could say if i is not equal to man, uh, you'd actually have to play with that to find out if it is a speed increase because it's not guaranteed that that it is. Ifs take time to evaluate as well. We load it in; it's working. So let's call, let's make another array of random values. Once again, they are not in sorted order. Min sort of arr. Now let's look at the contents, 0 0.06, 0 0.3, 0 0.39, 391, 394, 74, 78, or sorry, 47, 48, 72, 74, 75, 96. We have our things in sorted order. So this is a min sort. Because these, uh, the swap operation is not inside of the inner for loop, we know automatically that this can only do length minus one swaps. So it happens to be a very good sort in the situation where your swaps are costly. However, just like the bubble sort, turns out the comparison is inside of the innermost loop. So it generally does, if, if as long as your comparisons are at least as expensive as the swapping is, you really didn't buy much with the min sort compared to a bubble sort. 